Hi folks, today we're going to be discussing uh, twin pregnancies and specifically the impact of chorionicity on the risk of intrauterine fetal demise in twin pregnancies. So this presentation was prepared by the authors listed there, who at the time were second year Duke NUS medical students who had just completed their obstetrics and gynecology clinical clerkship. So what's the relevance of twin pregnancies to contemporary obstetrics? Well, traditionally, it's quite well known that twin pregnancies are associated with a poorer outcome compared to singleton pregnancies. And it just so happens that over the past 20 to 30 years, there's been a dramatic rise in the rate of twin pregnancies. So you can see there, both in the US and Singapore, there have been uh, quite marked increases in the twin birth rate. And it's thought that this is because of two main reasons. One is the use of these ARTs, assisted reproductive technologies, such as in vitro fertilization. And such procedures are associated with quite a dramatic um, increase in risk for twin pregnancy. And also, in recent years, there's been a trend towards mothers choosing to uh, have uh, children at a later age. And so an older maternal age is also associated with an increased risk of twin pregnancy. So when we're discussing twin pregnancies, you'll hear the terms chorionicity and amnionicity, which relate to the number of placentas or the number of gestational sacs, respectively. So you can see from this diagram that you can have a mono or a dichorionic twin pregnancy, which would have a single or a double placenta, and you can have a mono or a diamniotic pregnancy, where you'll have a single or a double gestational sac. And for the purpose of this current paper, We'll mainly be focusing on the monochorionic diamniotic pregnancy and the dichorionic diamniotic pregnancy. So these pregnancies are the same with the exception that one will have a twin placentas and the other will have single placenta. So you can see here that depending on the time at which you'll have cleavage of the fertilized ovum, you'll have a different placentation for the twin pregnancy. So cleavage at less than 72 hours following fertilization will yield a diamniotic, dichorionic, or DADC placentation, whilst cleavage between days 4 to 7 will yield a diamniotic, monochorionic, or DAMC uh, placentation, and that would form the majority of monozygous twins, the DAMC configuration. And as you see, if you have later and later uh, cleavage of the ovum, eventually you'll have uh, conjoined twins rather, where you'll have um, cleavage of the ovum after day 13. And this would be the rarest of the monozygous twin placentations. So I mentioned previously that twin pregnancies are associated with a poorer maternal outcome compared to singleton pregnancies. And it was previously thought that it was zygosity rather than chorionicity that dictated the, the risk for adverse outcomes in twin pregnancy. But it was later found that it was chorionicity, or the number of placentas, which dictates the outcome of the twin pregnancy more so than zygosity. And so monochorionic uh, twin pregnancies are known to have a poorer outcome compared to dichorionic twin pregnancies. So I've shown here a screen capture of the article header which is uh, entitled The Impact of Chorionicity on Risk and Timing of Intrauterine Fetal Demise in Twin Pregnancies. And this was put out in late 2012 by the authors indicated there. And if you're interested in looking up the full text of this article, you can use this uh, screen capture to help you do that. So what was this article all about? Well, the authors indicate there were two main aims for this study. The first of which was to determine how chorionicity relates to the risk of intrauterine fetal demise, IUFD, uh, on one or both of the fetuses. So this was the main aim of this uh, paper. They also mention a second aim, which was to describe how chorionicity, whether mono or dichorionic, impacted the risk and timing of a second death in pregnancies where you had uh, a first death, and then you had a second death. They wanted to look at how that second death would relate. Uh, in terms of timing and in terms of chorionicity. 
This was a retrospective cohort study done between 1990 and 2008 at Washington University Medical Center examining routine second trimester sonographic anatomic surveys of twin pregnancies between 17 and 22 weeks of gestation. The main outcome studied was IUFD. As this was a study of twin pregnancies, singleton and higher order multiple gestations were excluded. Monoamniotic twins were also excluded as monoamnionicity is a confounding factor known to be associated with higher risks. Pregnancies complicated by twin-to-twin -twin transfusion syndrome or TTTS and fetal death before 20 weeks of gestation were similarly excluded. Pregnancies with incomplete follow-up were dropped from the study. Data was retrieved primarily from medical records and supplemented by patient-derived information such as medical, obstetrical, and social histories obtained between 17 and 22 weeks of gestation. The authors also looked at any antenatal and delivery complications and at the neonatal outcomes. The frequency of follow-up was 3 to 4 weeks for all twins in the study, with NST or BPP done twice a week, starting from 32 weeks of gestation. In addition, monochorionic twins were checked every 2 weeks for TTTS. If any evidence of TTTS was found, that pregnancy was excluded from the study. These are the key definitions used in the study. Chorionicity was determined by the earliest available ultrasound and confirmed by pathology specimens from some of the pregnancies. Gestational age was defined as the first day of the last menstrual period. If the gestational age by the earliest ultrasound dating deferred, the gestational age was reassigned according to ultrasound dating using the biometry of the larger twin when dating the pregnancy. IUFD or intrauterine fetal death was defined as fetal death which occurred at least 20 weeks into the pregnancy and confirmed by ultrasound. IUGR was defined as having an estimated fetal birth weight below the 10th percentile. The data collected was analyzed using data software. Analysis were ran to compare baseline characteristics of the twin pregnancies the overall relative risk of IUFD, the risk of IUFD of either twin, and the prospective risk of IUFD. Pregnancies with double IUFD were compared against those with single IUFD to identify other factors associated with loss of the second twin. So this waterfall chart depicts the flow of participants in the study. Over 18 years, 2,445 twin pregnancies were scanned in total, of which 112 pregnancies were excluded. The criteria for exclusion included 1. Pregnancies of monoamniotic twins 2. Pregnancies that had twin-to-twin -twin transfusion syndrome and 3. Pregnancies with higher order multiples. After excluding pregnancies with the aforementioned exclusion criteria, 2,333 pregnancies were left. Of that, 172 pregnancies were lost to follow-up. But that still left 2,161 pregnancies with complete follow-up. And of that, 1,665 were dichorionic pregnancies and 496 were monochorionic pregnancies. So as you can see, the ratio of dichorionic to monochorionic pregnancies was approximately 3 is to 1. So moving on to the results of the study, it was found that there is a higher risk of intrauterine fetal demise in monochorionic pregnancies versus dichorionic twin pregnancies. If we look at the upper half of the chart, we see that the intrauterine fetal demise risk in a dichorionic pregnancy is 3.4%. For a monochorionic twin pregnancy, the, in, the risk of IUFD is 6%. Put this in context, the risk of fetal demise in a singleton pregnancy is 0.6%. So for a dichorionic twin pregnancy, the risk is 5 times more. And for a monochorionic twin pregnancy, the risk is actually 10 times more. The adjusted odds ratio for intrauterine fetal demise 
in monochorionic pregnancies versus dichorionic pregnancies is 1.69. The same holds true for double fetal demise. Looking at the bottom half of the chart, we see that the risk of double fetal demise in a dichorionic pregnancy is 1.2%, whereas the risk of double fetal demise in a monochorionic pregnancy is 2.4%. And here, the adjusted odds ratio is 2.11. This chart shows the prospective risk of intrauterine fetal death by gestational age. Note that the risk at each gestational age is the risk for any intrauterine fetal death for the rest of the pregnancy. So, for example, at 20 to 21 weeks, the risk of intrauterine fetal death for a dichorionic pregnancy for the rest of that pregnancy is 6%. And the risk for intrauterine fetal death in a monochorionic pregnancy for the rest of that pregnancy is 3.4%. As can be seen in this chart, the risk of intrauterine fetal death in monochorionic twins is higher than dichorionic twins before 28 weeks, after which the risk of monochorionic intrauterine fetal death actually falls below that of dichorionic fetal death. It is worth noting then also that at 36 to 37 weeks, the percentage of continuing monochorionic and dichorionic pregnancies is comparable at approximately 50%. However, there are no intrauterine fetal deaths after term. The authors do not attempt to explain these findings and why, beyond 28 weeks, the risk of monochorionic fetal death falls below dichorionic intrauterine fetal death. This chart provides data supporting the secondary outcome of the study, which is that double demise occurs primarily before 24 weeks, regardless of chorionicity. In this chart, we have divided pregnancies with double fetal demise according to the gestational age of the second twin at the time of the second twin's demise. So if, if we look at monochorionic pregnancies, we find that 58% of pregnancies with double fetal demise had their second twin intrauterine fetal death occur before 24 weeks. And in 75% of dichorionic pregnancies with double fetal demise, the intrauterine fetal death of the second twin occurred before 24 weeks. Now, we come to the overall impression of the paper study. The study was well done in several aspects. Firstly, this is a retrospective study with large sample size that supports the research topic in question. Secondly, authors have also taken good effort in adjusting for characteristic mismatches of the sample using statistics. However, the weakness of the paper mainly lies in the extensive study time frame used. Over 18 years, the practice of management of twins might have changed considerably, hence influencing the outcome of the pregnancy study. There's also sample bias because only twins from one medical center was used. And also, in characterizing the confounders, authors choose to use a yes or no method instead of using a continuous model. The clinical value of the study is rather limited. This is because the research outcome of the study is largely unsurprising. A paper published five years ago has already shown that MCDA twins tend to have poorer outcomes as compared to DCDA twins. This study is also limited because only one outcome, IUSD, was studied, leaving out important complications of twin pregnancies such as preterm labor, PRAP, and TPTS. In conclusion, this study has shown that monochronic twins carry an increased risk of fetal death compared to dichronic twins, and it has also shown that double demise occurs at time less than 24 weeks, regardless of chronicity. However, there is limited amounts of clinical useful data provided in this paper. The author used the minimum publishable unit model to publish a subset of large data that is available. Other than that, the usefulness of the outcome measured, which is the IUFD, may not fully account for the clinical practice where the other outcomes such as neurological effects are not accounted. Finally, 
The paper also studies the second order effect. The twin pregnancy itself already presents a higher risk than single just a single pregnancy in no matter whether the chronicity or not. Last but not least, we would like to take this opportunity to thank all the doctors and nurses at Kikli Hospital Department of OMG for volunteering the time and expertise to help us. Thank you.